I'm Ryan Grace, and with me today, the one, the only, Frank Caberna. Hello. Special guest. So happy to be here. Um, hopefully only really special for today. I'm excited. This is going to be hopefully a whole journey into the crypto verse. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me, Ryan. Very excited uh, about the new show you got going. Hell yeah. We're going on a journey, Frank. You're going to be a staple on the show. Every Monday, Frank Coburn is going to be on the show with us here at 430. Awesome. And um, like you said, we're going to go on a crypto journey. The idea is this is going to be kind of like a, a crypto where do I start? Yeah. But you've already gotten started. I'm curious um, what got you into crypto or the allure, I guess, to sure. you. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. But we're going to go all over the place kind of looking at, you know, some of the, you know, maybe the initial steps you take, how do you think about some of these things, try to provide some perspective, but I want you to ask any of the questions that you have. I'm sure a lot of people, if they're new to crypto, they're crypto curious, they're following along, they're going to have those same questions. So feel free to go off the rails, Frank. Um, it's a lot more fun that way. But for anybody that doesn't know who you are, the one, the only Frank Aberna, what are you doing on this show? Who are you and why are you in crypto now? I am... Uh, pretty much as average as it gets. Oh, Just your, okay. your average guy. Except for that haircut. A haircut, Looking better nice. than average. Looking nice. Height, lesser than average. It's okay. Um, it's a balance, my friend. But yeah, I um, got a new haircut recently. I see that. And it's funny, I was telling you off air, it, it was the first haircut that I've gotten since maybe ever that... Uh, you know how like in the haircut place they they have a mirror that makes it look good pretty much no matter what it looks like when Magic you're in there mirror. Yeah. a lot of times you go home and you're like oh wow Lighting's this different. doesn't look that good this is the best haircut i've ever gotten and there's absolutely a correlation to the price of the haircut okay. i was telling you that you, what you pay for yeah like i, I <laughs> forever have been going to get like a 25 dollar haircut and then i'll get home like i say and i'll be like oh this looks awful um, or it doesn't look as good as I thought it looked there or what I wanted. And then I, our, our mutual friend and coworker, Todd. Um, oh, this is a Todd recommendation. Todd recommendation. Okay. And he has good tastes. Yeah, I mean, Todd's won, I think he's won hair of the year twice now, the last two years in a row. <laughs> is that at, serious? At the company, yeah, hair of the year. <laughs> he's got a great hair, okay? And 22, so 23, and I, maybe, maybe this year. We'll I don't know how it came up. I think he was making fun of me because my hair looked so stupid, and he was like, oh, you got to go to my person. And also, she's like two blocks away. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, yeah, it's convenient. I'll try it out. I'll make Todd feel good. He's helping out, you know, one of the younger guys, whatever. Um, and I go, and it's like, okay, it's going to be 50, 60 bucks. I'm like, all right, fine, whatever. Damn, I can, okay. I've gotten to a place where I can spend that on a haircut. Yeah. And I walked out of there and went, got back to the office, went home, did the whole thing. And I was like, I'll be damned if this haircut doesn't look great. And it was truly one of those things that, like, you get what you pay for. Yeah. Like, a, a joke with me always is, like, uh, people will always point out, like, oh, that thing's really cheap. Or, like, that's really cheap. Or, like, don't so worry so much about coworker XYZ. Like, you know, they're not getting paid a lot or whatever. There's a difference between <laughs> something being cheap and something being a good value. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, uh, like you could find the cheapest coin out there and be like, oh, this is way cheaper than Bitcoin. I'm going to buy a thousand of these coins. And then it could go to zero the next day. And it wasn't good value, was it? And the haircut thing is one of those things that I was just like, oh, I've been paying 20 bucks for a bad haircut. Paid $60, got a great one. Taking things seriously. I'm starting to, I'm starting to slowly build in my life. And that's who I am. That's why I'm here. Well, I like what you did there. It kind of segued back into crypto here. I do think you've got to put some pressure on them, though. You get in the chair, and naturally, you know, it's like the what have you watched on Netflix, all of that um, mundane conversation. But just put some pressure on them. Let them know that, well, I'm on camera for a living, so <laughs> see what you, you think got. they'll take it more seriously? See what you got. Yeah, I think so. Well, maybe they'll know. start shaking. You know, I don't. Maybe maybe you don't want to tell them that. If you're like going sense. to like into heart surgery or something like that. And you told the surgeon, like, hey, by the way, like, I'm worth $2 billion. Would they be like, oh, we're not going to mess this up then? We were going to maybe mess it up. Well, you probably aren't going to the cheapest surgeon either yeah. at, at that point. All right. But, yeah, put a little pressure on him, Frank. We'll see Let's talk time. 
crypto. This is uh, the crypto starter kit. We're going to talk about market awareness today. When you think back to any of the Where Do I Start series on Tasty Live, we often begin with kind of what do you look at? How do you think about markets? It's not jumping right into here are the trading strategies. Here's what you need to know about options in that sense. It's more so really broadly. How do I approach the market? Where do I get started? We're going to do that here on the show today. So we're going to go over all the different data points, some of the tools that I use as well. But I want you to, like I said, take us off the rails. If you have a question that naturally comes up, please ask it going forward. I don't think we have the chat turned on today on YouTube Live, but if you're watching on YouTube, we'll turn that chat on and um, we'll take questions as well. But before we get into that, I just want to take a quick look at what's going on in the market here. Um, maybe most importantly, just look at volatility. And this is something that we're going to talk about in a second as to why we look at this, but I want to start to, to look at yeah. um, kind of what's happening in the market at the beginning of every show. So if you've been following um, price action post the ETF announcements, you haven't really seen much, right? We saw a pretty big dip down 20%, but since then, we've really traded sideways. Volatility has come in quite yeah. a bit. And so that's been the theme, really low vol. When we look at where volatility is right now, you use the standard IV rank. Where is that current implied volatility relative to the range that it's been in over the last year? And we're towards the low end of the range. For context, the Bitcoin implied vol in there on a 30-day basis, the low is close to 30. And so at 43%, that gives us an IV of 28, um, kind of towards the lower quartile or, or percentile there in a sense. Yeah, and, and just on the nominal side of volatility, it looks super low to me. Um, and yeah, and yeah, just as a, a, a another in, introduction, I I am someone who kind of knows about. Obviously, I've been following crypto markets closer and closer over the course of the last five years, and now I'm like really trying to take a little bit of a plunge here into trying to know as much as possible. But I know enough that a forty to forty five percent volatility in Bitcoin is pretty friggin' low. Like, get, like I am remembering periods where we were around triple digits, if not higher, in Bitcoin volatility. And that's for the, the people out there who aren't, you know, math or, or options theory specialist. That's essentially saying, hey, in the next year, this market is expected to either double or essentially get more than cut in half. And we're not in that right now. We're we're in, like I say, a, a 40 to 45 percent volatility range, which means volatile, but almost like a, like a crude oil, like crude oil volatility is around 40 percent a lot of the time. And, and that's volatile, but that's not something that gets that's doubles or, or gets cut in half in uh, an average year, I guess. Exactly. Yeah, this is really low. And just for context, and we've pulled up a five year chart yeah. um, just trying to get the, the volatility on trading view here. So this is DVOL, um, and this is implied volatility. You can see about 43%. But to Frank's point, this has been triple digits, well over 100% over time. And as you might expect, as an asset class matures, you're likely going to see lower volatility. Doesn't mean that we can't get a spike. And when you have an asset like Bitcoin that trades at 40, 50,000 and has a 50% vol, um, that's still a pretty big move, still right? Volatile. So uh, you can see that here we are kind of off of the lows. There's that 30 level that I was talking about, but um, has is, come in quite a bit. Isn't over it the funny, last though, that, that like the volatility peaked right with that ETF announcement, essentially, like more or less, a, give or take a week around that announcement. And it, and it was the story. I mean, you know better than anyone. It was the story. That's the story. That's the story going into it. Almost like I, I'm reminded, all political, whatever aside, when Trump was elected and it's like he's starting to win. I remember that night and Ball is spiking, it's spiking, it's spiking and, and S&Ps are getting hammered. Yes. And he, he wins and then from there on out, the coming weeks and months was just low, low, low volatility just coming off of those highs. And it is true. It's, it's just always funny to me that like, the event that everyone's looking forward to and is like, this is going to be crazy. And then it happens and it's like, oh, the craziness was actually the lead up. Yes. Now we're, we're in a little bit of a doldrums. And I loved in your graphic pointing out the range 
of Bitcoin, because I do, and I know everyone's going to be mad that I, I assimilate it to crude oil price action, but in crude, a lot of times you get caught in these 5 to $10 ranges. Yeah. And Bitcoin, similarly, I always kind of, as someone who's not fully into it all the time, it's usually in these like 5 to 10K ranges, and it feels like we've been trapped in 40 to 45 for ever at this point. Yeah, and I think to your point, you know, this is really not that much different from what you see in traditional markets, right? Why would it be um, going into the ETF announcements? A lot of uncertainty. There is a known unknown. Yeah. Um, this event is going to occur. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. Very similar to trading options around a stock's earnings announcement or trading an FOMC announcement or whatever it might be. We know that something's going to happen. And most of the time, we see a response that's you know a little bit less than what the market was pricing in. There's edge in selling that implied volatility or that premium there embedded in the market, and that's exactly what we saw. Yeah. Right. If I look back to where uh, vol was going into the ETF announcement and right around that date, we were looking at expected moves on a weekly basis that were almost double yeah. what we've got here today. So what does this mean? 43% vol. I'm not sure what the, the price is. I think Bitcoin is, uh, f I've got 42,393, uh, so a little bit lower. Half, yeah. yeah, so oh. a little bit lower than 42,6. But at 42,6 with a 43% implied vol, we can expect a one standard deviation move 60% or so of the time, right? Two thirds of the time. Um, we're expecting the market, or the market is, I suppose, expecting the price to trade within this range of about $2,500. Cool. So 40 roughly on the downside, 45 on the upside. Doesn't mean it'll stay there. But if you approach the market realistically, this is what's being priced in. That could change in a heartbeat, but that's what we've got here today. Yeah. And again, but, not much different than what we see in traditional markets. Um, you know, buy the rumors, sell the news, and the volatility collapse ensues shortly it's, thereafter. It's, I know that that's obviously a big thing is buy the rumors, sell the news. But it, to me, it's it's almost like if if your friend or like your uncle or like a family member is telling you a black swan event is coming, yeah, it's almost definitely not going to be a black swan. Like, again, it was like leading up to using Trump again as an analogy. It's like if he gets elected, it's going to be crazy. And it's like if you're ready for crazy – Crazy's not cut like it's literally yeah, crazy's black, priced in, in black a sense. yeah like black swan is literally like y you uh, have no clue what's going to happen yeah um, and that being said when we when you get to lower vol levels that's when maybe some of the oh yeah it's been in forty to forty five k forever it's going to stay in there whatever that's usually when you do get the like oh crap it's up forty percent or it's down fifty percent or what have you so. Uh, We'll, we'll see. Yeah, you're getting to levels where, you know, it's definitely cheaper, obviously, to yeah. participate, um, buy those options that are, you know, on the tails one way or the other. I, I will point out, though, what you often see in crypto, in digital assets, is this inverse relationship in terms of uh, what typically is observed in traditional finance, in the S&P, right? So there's often a positive correlation okay. between vol and price in crypto versus what we see elsewhere, right? We see the VIX spike, people bid protection when the market sells off. So stocks are down, we would expect to, expect to see the VIX up. Once in a while, you see a big up move in the market and you see you know a bid in the calls and you do see a little bit of a rise in the VIX, but nowhere near, as you know, what you would see if we were in the midst of a sell-off. In this space, when volatility is ripping, I would say more often than not, the price is also sure. moving a lot higher. Um, this can move a lot. Everybody knows that. But your 10% up move um, you know, happens quite a bit, and you're going to see that spike in implied volatility as people rush in to speculate on more upside. And isn't that funny that like you and I are so used to talking about positive – like this isn't a new thing, a market with uh, – upside skew, whatever you want to call it. And we would always say, oh, there's fear to the upside. Yeah. Um, at gold, market like that. Uh, well, crude oil, back to your example, crude, right? Crude oil. Geopolitical risk um, gives you that upside. It is funny because this market, the, the term that is new, I think, to markets, and is particularly for this one, is FOMO. Yeah. And, and it, is, it is funny that, like, it hasn't really set in until you highlighted the correlation between price and volatility that it's like, Oh yeah, no crap. Like it, it's f literally FOMO in derivatives markets, where it's like people are more worried 
about not getting in when this market jumps from 20k to 45k that vol jumps then then if the market falls from 45k to 20k it's been kind of a slower grind um which is funny because i know we're going to talk about liquidity a lot on this show um and, and that's something that you would almost think given the relative illiquidity to an s p market or a treasury market um, you would almost expect that fear to be the, to the downside. But one of the, I'm sure, many different characteristics that we'll mine throughout uh, our time here. Yeah, let's talk about some of that. So I'm curious, as we jump into this, Frank, I know you have some positions. You've been in the space for a little while. We've talked about this off camera a bit. So some of this is not going to be new to you when we talk about what we look at here. But before we jump into that, what got you into crypto? Because a lot of people still are, you know, maybe they're on the fence, maybe they're apathetic. Um, a lot of people uh, don't know what this is necessarily yeah. or what it represents. You still have the, um, I suppose, the Warren Buffetts and Charlie Munger's rest in peace who are saying this is just a toxic, toxic thing. Right. Um, what got you into this? Um, I I'm going to be completely honest here, um, and I'm going to be as honest as I can be throughout my time on the show. Um, hey, don't <clears throat> lie to us. Wouldn't dream of it. Okay. But yeah, this is to say anything I've ever done on camera it's prior been to this for has years. been lies. Um, I don't know really anything about crypto practical use cases. Okay. Okay. And I have, yeah, thanks to you and different people in my life, I've learned a little bit to be like, I can see, I can see a future in which this is a really big part of our economy and part of our daily lives. Okay. And so without knowing so much about it, but knowing historically how technological advancements have gone and how you've seen markets tend to act around those technological advancements, um, when Bitcoin was trading around 20K, 25K, and it was kind of stuck in that sludge for so many months recently, I started to buy a little bit, not as much as obviously I, at, at this point, I would have loved to buy as much as I could have. Um, I started to buy a little bit because I once started to learn a little and, and see a little bit of the future, um, but mostly because I was like, if this market does take off to the tune of, you know, the most recent run up, which I would call kind of the dot-com boom and bust, and then the last 20 years of technology stocks like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and recently some of the stuff you're seeing with semiconductors and AI over the last you know handful of years here. And I was like, if this thing does that, and I have no upside in this market, I'm gonna be really pissed. Because in the same way, I was a hipster in high school, and I'm like, iPhones are, are starting to come out and everything, and I'm like, I don't see it, like blah, blah, blah. And my personal opinion or my lack of depth of knowledge in the technology space and lack of money, I was in high school, so I don't kick myself too much, but I was like, I don't see a future for this stuff, and I got to be like the cynical jerk that was like, blah, 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 it's not gonna be real. And I, then I came to find out, like, one, I don't know Jack about the future, and I have had an iPhone ever since that time period, and I, I depend on so many of those stocks. Um, and two, that's my personal opinion. Yeah. Like, I, I, I haven't, for example, had a Facebook since high school. I had it for like six months, and I was like, I'm not into this. I've never had a Facebook. But look at Meta stock. Like, I don't have to necessarily be fully aligned with this thing to have given myself upside in that market that would, over the course of, the last 10 to 20 years have been have put me in a completely different setting from a wealth standpoint. That's a great point. And that's my that's that's what but now I'm here with you because I'm like okay, I'm starting to gain some upside in this market. And there are days Ryan where I talk with you and I see it, and there are days where you show me some stuff and I'm like I don't see it. Like yeah. this stuff could tomorrow be all fake and I have no clue. And so I'm here with you to learn more. But I think at some point, hopefully I get enough of a foundation that we almost set out to to bust some myths, almost yeah. like look at different like that idea. cryptos, look at different ways that you can use crypto and be like, 
that thing doesn't really work, that thing could work. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I'm, I'm here to to learn and, and kind of just get a better foundation behind this, uh, like I say, upside in crypto that I've started to build. I like how you put that because, uh, and this applies to, as you mentioned, Meta or what your subjective view is on XYZ. I think it's overvalued because versus some historical precedent, it's overvalued. But you have to ask yourself that it's all right, what is it really about? Are we here to be right or are we here to make money? You know? The, se um, the second one, maybe I was here to be right 10 years ago. I'm here to make money now. I think when you, whether you read the investing books or you talk about some of the big hedge fund managers, the famous people in the space, a lot of people have made a lot of money just participating in the bubbles, right? I want to make money. We'll participate in the bubble. I'm not saying that this is necessarily a bubble, but I think we have to remove sometimes the feelings and the emotion and understand what it is that we're doing. So I love that you brought that up. That said, you do have to categorize some of these things. There's a bunch of stuff out there that's vaporware. Maybe most yeah. of it is. But there's also stuff that's real, really real. Um, and I don't think that you can convolute the whole space in a sense. Um, you want to, to make sure that like you're at least aware of what's going on. So all of that said, and I don't know, we might run out of time here. I'm not sure if we can run over or not. If we've got anybody after us, maybe we can get a couple minutes if we don't. But the first thing that I look at here, Frank, and well, maybe let me take a step back. Sure. Let's talk about this from the perspective of Bitcoin, because I think that that's real. It's important to understand what are these assets? Yeah. What does this thing even represent, right? And so when we talk about Bitcoin, we're talking about a cryptocurrency. A token or a coin, yes, but a currency that's native to the underlying blockchain. So you have cryptocurrencies, and then you have tokens. Ethereum is a cryptocurrency. Uh, it's the native currency of the Ethereum blockchain. But then you have tokens that sit on top of that, in a sense. It's very easy. Anybody can really create a token. Deploy a token. Uh, what is it worth? I don't know. Um, but there is something, I think, intrinsically valuable about what Bitcoin represents, value transmission across a network, what it represents as essentially, you know, it's been compared to a life raft or a lifeboat mm -hmm. um, from the sinking ship, the indebtedness of, you know, a lot of sovereign nations of our government and those around the world. You know, a lot of people look at it that way, digital gold. But there is something to it in that sense, right? I mean, if your view is that the kind of global uh, economic policy or central bank policy, not just out of the Fed, but out of just about everybody, is going to continue um, printing money, low interest rates, I get that we're not in that environment right now. But if you think that's coming again, then you're going to see asset price inflation. Mm -hmm. And this has been an asset that since day one, yeah, does it go down at times? Is it very volatile? Yes, it is. But if you've owned this for a long period of time, um, you've done very, very well, right? It's certainly outperformed the Fed's balance sheet sure. expansion. Um, it's outperformed many other assets. You know, So if you kind of look at it as all the same thing and there's going to be asset price inflation, well, this is something that I think has a really interesting risk reward profile. And I'm really excited to, and that is for, sorry for the pun, but kind of both sides of the coin to me, which is I'm excited to learn more about why the asset price itself moves the way that it does because that is, yeah, like you say, digital gold, whatever you want to call it, like, oh, interest rates go down, Bitcoin price goes up, whatever. But the, the piece that I'm really interested in is the practical use cases for, like you say, the tokens on top of these chains. What, when I buy Bitcoin, I don't only want to make money off of the asset price speculation, but how can I put, okay, I converted, my, Ryan, I converted my US dollars into Bitcoin. What the hell can I do with this now to strategize and potentially make money on top of this asset just growing? And that's, you know, everything from the simple staking, which I think a lot of people who have, you know, invested in anything that bears a dividend or an interest rate, will understand pretty quickly. But then also, uh, you are constantly showing me these different tools uh, for um, th that show how these uh, different
coins and these different essentially companies can leverage the Bitcoin blockchain or the Ethereum blockchain to actually go out there and, and commit practical services that generate revenue yeah. like, a, like a company. And, and that's the part that I, I didn't understand. I think a lot of people didn't see is that there's you're not only just converting your cash to these digital currencies to be like, oh, I hope it goes up in price. There's a use case. That, that's the whole thing, right? Is that you're supposed to put this money to work in these different ways, loan it out, earn a, a, a certain percentage in tandem with the amount of risk you're taking, obviously, like anything else. Uh, but I'm really excited to explore those avenues. Awesome. And we're going to do that on this show for sure. But I think to answer your question, you know, like what drives this, in my opinion, this is simply driven by liquidity, okay. global liquidity. Um, if anybody wants to pull up a chart of, I'm trying to think of like what would it be a good measurement of this or proxy, probably the rate of change of M2, of global M2, right? Are we seeing the money supply grow? Uh, is it expanding or is it contracting? It's not so much like the absolute level, but the rate of change on a year over year basis is probably a good way to look at this. You'll find that if you do it that way, there's a pretty strong positive correlation between the price of, uh, of Bitcoin versus you know that expansion in, in overall money supply. Um, you would find that uh, as well to be the case for Apple stock or yeah. you name it, investable assets, right? Driven by liquidity. Um, hard to find a period where there was, you know, expanding money supply, loose monetary policy, and asset prices didn't benefit. Sure. You know, I mean, we've experienced that for the last decade or so, and in other places, um, a lot longer. Japan comes to mind. So I think it's really important to kind of understand what drives this, right? It's not going to drive it on a day-to-day -day basis, but you have to understand where are you in the cycle. Yeah. Because we have these periods of time, crypto winter, good luck. Maybe you have picked the bottom. Um, it's going to be choppy. It's going to be hard. There's opportunities there, but you have to be able to stomach that volatility. It is a lot easier to make money in some of these markets when you can identify, you know, that bull market. Um, I think, you know, we've seen a series of kind of these almost booms and busts in a you know kind of broader overall expansion of a, a larger um, bull market, but you need to identify where you are. Mm -hmm. If you believe that Bitcoin is gonna be $100,000 or whatever the arbitrary number is, right? Where are we in that kind of smaller cycle within that overall change? And just look at whether it's moving averages or uh, the percentage return on a monthly basis. You know, I want to identify the trend. So that's the first thing that I'm going to look at. Is this a bullish trend or is it a bearish trend? That might not be the case when you're trading volatility, you're trading options, you're trading other instruments. It's absolutely the case here. You can buy it or you can sell it. Well, it's harder to buy something that's being sold off pretty consistently mm -hmm. and putting in a series of lower highs than it is to buy something that's putting in a series of higher lows, right? Sure. I want to buy dips in an uptrend, and I want to sell rips in a downtrend. Um, that's probably the, the basic place that I would start, and you can apply that to any token. Most of the time, when you look across the space, there's going to be a pretty high positive correlation among things. Um, you're going to see relative outperformance at times. We'll talk about that in a second. But generally, this stuff moves together. It's unlikely that Bitcoin's down 50% on the year and Ethereum's up 100%. Sure. Maybe. We just haven't really seen that. So I think the first thing to key in on is the price performance. The second thing is just volatility. We've talked about that already. Have some understanding of what to expect, right? If you're going to go into this and you want to make an investment, you want to trade something, and this applies to really any asset, right? You need to know what the vol is. How does it trade? what should I expect? It's a $50,000 underlying instrument. Well, if it has a 90 vol or a 20 vol, that's a huge difference in what you can expect, how you might size your position as well. No one is out here saying, put everything you got into crypto. Absolutely not. I do think that you should have some exposure, but that should be relative to what your risk appetite is, what you're comfortable with, which should be a function of, you know, can you withstand really high vol? Is that something maybe you want to size down? Or just be aware of where are we, right? Historically, vol's been triple digits. It's 40 right now. 
maybe you kind of wait and see what happens. I don't know, but you should be aware of the volatility. Those are the first two things that I'm looking at. Are you familiar with Bitcoin dominance? Um, not as a verbatim term. Okay. I have seen its dominance for sure. I mean, it's it's the largest market cap coin by the, the second largest being Ethereum, and it's it's more than double the market cap of Ethereum. Yeah, I'm pulling up a chart here. We're back to trading views, just so you can see where this is right now. Uh, 52%, and I'm clicking all over the place. Apologies. Um, this is Bitcoin dominance. So this is the market cap, like you said, of Bitcoin relative to the total market cap of all oh, other- the entire space. Yes. Wow, of okay. investable assets. Um, you know, I don't know if this includes stable coins or not, but the simple way to look at this is just what's the market cap of Bitcoin versus the other things that you can invest in. And right now, Bitcoin really makes up, well, about half of the investable market cap, yeah. right? You want to understand where this is. There's certain things that are going to drive it. Um, to me, it comes down to relative performance. And so to expand on this concept for a second, when I'm looking at investing in tokens, I want to understand what's the alternative. What's the benchmark? In a way, this is the beta, right? If I want crypto exposure and the easiest way to get it in one form or another is by investing in Bitcoin. Now you can do it through ETFs, you can do it through futures, you can do it through spot, however you wanna get that exposure. I wanna look at how Bitcoin is performing relative to other assets. Sure. Because if we're seeing significant outperformance of Bitcoin versus XYZ token, it might make more sense than simply just to be in Bitcoin. Yeah. Whatever the reason is that's driving that market, um, that's where the flow is going. It's not in the altcoins. Maybe later on in the bull market, you know, we've seen Bitcoin has made its move. You look for alternatives to, to play catch up in a sense, but you want to pay attention to where this is and maybe where it's come from. Um, it's not a, you know, predictive of where you're going to go in the future, but it's good to, again, understand what kind of environment are we in? Yeah. Are we in an environment where well, it's late stage, people are taking a lot of risk, they're investing in all sorts of different things, or is this kind of the beginnings of a bull market where Bitcoin's getting up off the floor and you're still seeing a pretty significant, you know, Bitcoin dominance metric? Sure, and and this to me screams like uh, Fang stocks or yeah. whatever, whatever you want to say, where it's like Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. Those top five stocks are you know 20 percent of the S and P. It's a great way to look at it, and and it's essentially if you're a trend follower and Bitcoin is becoming more dominant you probably want to be longing Bitcoin, right? If it's gone from, you know, 45% dominance to 50% and you're a trend follower, you're following that Bitcoin higher. If you're a contrarian, you're kind of selling into that. In the same way, I mean, we've seen it over the course of the last couple of years, the NASDAQ and S&P have absolutely spanked the Russell. So big caps versus small caps, and that can be kind of a Rorschach test for how you would view Bitcoin dominance versus Ethereum and some of the smaller caps. I think that's a great way to put it. That's a great way to look at it. Um, this environment that we're in right now, right? Tougher to make money trading small caps, yeah. trading the Russell versus you own something like NVIDIA and Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, you name it, right? You just need to be aware of the environment. There will be times where small caps double, triple, quadruple in price. Absolutely. It's just not right now. And so you need to understand what's happening. Yeah. What's the backdrop? That's what I use this for. Um, that's the way that I look at it. And I also think that it's important to use Bitcoin as a base currency and price other tokens in it. Mm -hmm. You can do that with some of the different charting software that's out there. But you want to understand, again, what's the relative performance, right? An example of that right now would be Ethereum versus Bitcoin. So if I just jump back to our chart here for a second and just pull this up, and we're just going to type in uh, ETH BTC and we'll just pull this, this chart up here. This is the price of Ethereum in Bitcoin. So you can see, you know, kind of trading sideways or pretty range bound um, over the last few years. But when you look at the last year, you've had opportunities to maybe buy dips in there and you've had some bounces. But generally speaking, um, Ethereum has underperformed Bitcoin pretty significantly. Now that could maybe change. And it looked like for a second it was going to change after the ETF announcements. Yeah. Now everybody's saying, oh, you're going to see an Ethereum ETF and you cut a bid in uh, Ethereum, but that's been sold. And so that's what I want to understand is given everything that I can put my money into, what makes the most sense? It's not that you won't make money in these other things at the same time. 
It's just that you miss out on that alpha, so to speak, you know, that relative outperformance of the other things if you're unaware of how to price this stuff or how to look at it in that sense. I, I, I love this idea. I'm excited to explore that further because it's almost like the opportunity cost of an Apple. You know, what, what would my NVIDIA be worth or Coca-Cola be worth if I measured it in the upside that Apple has seen? It's like NVIDIA would have been a better situation, Coca-Cola not so much so I, I'm, I'm really excited to explore that and yeah all these all these topics awesome the last two things that i want to talk about here because we're really out of time and um, we'll save the rest of this for the next show but it's also important to be aware of the news um i think there's a ton of great crypto media outlets out there um crypto news outlets so whether that's the block or it's decrypt or it's coindesk um, there's others as well so not just picking on those, but those are just a, a few that come to mind. You want to be aware of what the narrative is. Uh, most of the time, this stuff doesn't matter. And I would also say that what you think is driving the market probably isn't driving the market. Already but happened. it's good to kind of have an interpretation of what that narrative is, maybe understand why other people are making uh, the decisions that they're making. Just kind of like you would in anything else. Like, yeah. what is the narrative? Whether you agree with it or not, just be aware of it. And the final thing that... I don't think is touched on as much, or maybe it hasn't been in the past and you're starting to see this evolve a little bit more, just naturally. I absolutely think that you have to have an awareness of the macro backdrop, um, cross-asset correlations, volatility. Not only do you need to know what's happening in crypto, but if you think about this more so becoming an allocation for larger investors in their portfolio, more people yeah. participating in it, it's gonna mature, right? then you need to understand what's happening in the space where that other investment is occurring. We have yet to really see an environment where if you have a broad-based sell-off in risk assets, crypto outperforms or is bid to the upside, right? Uh, maybe outperforms in that it doesn't go down as much, but typically we see volatility spike. That idea that correlations go to one, volatility spikes, you tend to see that. And so be aware of what's happening there. I think it's also really important to, like I said, be aware of the liquidity cycle, where we are, understand policy mm -hmm. to some extent. Um, generally speaking, you know, higher interest rates, uh, higher cost of capital are a negative for you know, some of these assets. And I think when you look at crypto as um, you know, a hedge in some cases to what we've talked about uh, as being driven by dollar based policies it's important to understand what kind of environment are you in as it pertains to the dollar you know if you have an environment where uh, for one reason or another it's risk off or whatever it might be a slowing economy there's a bid in the dollar it's it's generally pretty strong can be a headwind for crypto versus you know what have we seen the federal reserve is buying 120 billion in assets per month weaker dollar policy zero interest rates generally a little bit more positive for a, uh, you know, an asset like this. So I think it's important to pay attention and, to that. And all of our multi-asset traders and also any investor who's owned stocks and anything will understand what we're, what we're getting at there because there's obviously a dynamic between stocks and bonds or stocks and gold or stocks and cash. Like you say, the U.S. dollar dynamics. So it, it's, it really, really excites me to see all these different angles and put on my board. I mean, why wouldn't you put on so many different permutations of new strategies uh, on your board to at least look at and potentially take advantage of in uh, in the future, man? I'm, I'm stoked. Absolutely. Well, we're going to get into all of that. We'll wrap up today's show. This is more of a part one. Went a lot longer than I thought it was going to go. I appreciate Ryan giving us the time here in the studio, letting us run over a little bit. We've talked about market awareness, macro themes, kind of how we think about price, understanding cycles. The next time you're back, Frank, we're going to talk some trade ideas. We're going to dig into some of the things you can do with this. And we're also going to look at kind of what I'll call the fundamentals, that on-chain data that you can pay attention to, those tools that you can use. We popped up a couple of them here, but I'll show you where to go to get that information that really helps how to think about whether I should invest in this token or this token. How do I compare these things? How do I analyze them? Um, we're gonna refine the approach when you're back on the next show. We'll go through those tools. But that's gonna do it for our show here today. Thanks for watching. This is the Tasty Crypto Show. We'll be back on Wednesday at 4.30. I'll be back with Mad Mike. 
Frank will be back next Monday, so stay tuned. But until then, I'm Ryan Grace. I'm Frank Cabrera. This is the Tasty Crypto Show.